mistake I'm letting go With our trust I'm holding on The substance of your hope and love The substance of your hope and love In your hand I'll face the storms Father, we uh, do want to just uh, turn our hearts and thoughts to your word now, and in particular, as Matthew continues to kind of guide us through the, the teaching and the life of Jesus, who he presents to us as the King and the Messiah. And uh, in these episodes we're going to look at, just see his tremendous heart for for the outcasts, for those that uh, no one else would care for, but Jesus cared for them. And uh, we just pray that uh, our hearts would be made a, a little more open, a little more tender towards uh, those uh, around us, Lord, that we would begin to have the, the compassion that you have uh, for others. And we ask this in, in Jesus' name. Amen. I, I don't know if you've ever had uh, someone show you extreme uh, compassion or grace when, when you didn't deserve it, but it's, it's a very hum, humbling thing, uh, and, um, and it uh, you know, uh, really impacts your life when you least expect it. I remember when uh, Kathy and I first started uh, dating, and then you come to that time to meet Kathy's parents and, uh, and everything, and you know, I, uh, uh, it's a little bit different image uh, in, in those days as the... <laughs> I had a beard down to about here, and uh, wore lots of turquoise jewelry, and and uh, was doing my stained glass thing, and uh, uh, you know, probably going through an identity crisis, trying to find myself or something, you know. But you know, my hair wasn't uh, that long, but it was kind of longer. It was a little thicker in those days as well. And uh, but anyway, I, I uh, put it in the shirt. I looked like something the dog drug in, you know, in my perspective of looking back, you know, and uh, self-employed make it worse, self-employed artists make it worse, you know, to this um, nice, you know, local families that I'm being introduced to, and and uh, they were so kind and so gracious and just treated me like I was the greatest guy that ever landed on the face of the earth. I mean, I, I was actually not prepared for it. They were just so kind and uh, it was unbelievable, and I, it was very humbling, and I just always, always appreciated that. And um, we're going to look at uh, incidents this morning. Again, Jesus is, is uh, coming off the Sermon on the Mount. He's coming down. He's going to encounter uh, three people. Matthew, uh, in a very Jewish Hebraic style, is going gonna, is gonna to give us over the next couple of chapters three sets of three miracles uh, that he does. These three uh, brought together in context, I think, to show us just the heart of God for, for the outcast. He's going to in, encounter a leper who was the ultimate outcast in that society, and then a, a Roman centurion, uh, and then a woman and, uh, who happens to be Peter's mother-in-law. In each case, uh, and then at the end, just a, a tremendous crowd that he ministers to. But in each case, uh, we see the heart of, of God. Now, again, Matthew shows us the miracles of Jesus for a couple of reasons. One, just to show us, uh, as I said, his heart, his compassion. And uh, there'll be other times that Jesus will look out in the crowds and then have compassion for them and begin to minister to them. Uh, secondly, he's trying to make sure that he's presenting to us, to the readers in the first century, the credentials of Jesus, the fact that he is the Messiah. And as the Messiah, uh, as uh, the Bible says, the Jews required of sign. And uh, one of those is the Messiah would have to do miracles. Again, throughout the Old Testament, very clearly when the Messiah comes, he will heal. He will heal with tremendous power. He will be able to do the miraculous and, and so forth. And um, that's not to say there weren't other people around in that day that did miracles. There were. That's not to say that there weren't other people that by, by God's grace were healed. They were. But so uh, what the Messiah had to do kind of had to be over the top in, in terms of uh, the healings and the miracles and so forth. And, and uh, Matthew wants to make sure that uh, he presents the credentials of Jesus as a Messiah. Uh, he healed uh, incredibly in terms of the numbers and, and what he did. And then as he'll point out at the end... He wants to make sure that we understand that uh, in doing these things, uh, Jesus was fulfilling uh, prophecy. 
Let's take a look at the uh, first encounter. Jesus responds compassionately to an outcast, verse 1 to 4. When he came down from the mountainside, large crowds followed him. A man with leprosy came and knelt before him and said, Lord, if you're willing, you can make me clean. Jesus reached out his hand and touched the man. I am willing, he said, be clean. Immediately he was cured of his leprosy. Uh, then Jesus said to him, see that you don't tell anyone, but go. Show yourself to the priests and offer the gift Moses commanded as a testimony to them. Uh, again, he comes off the mountain, but before that, several weeks ago for us, I don't think it took several weeks for Jesus to give the Sermon on the Mount. It just took us several weeks to go through it. And, uh, but before that, in, in chapter 4, uh, it says that, and Jesus healed them all, everyone that, uh, that comes to him. It's not he sealed, healed some or some of them got healed. Everyone that came, they all got, got healed. Uh, Josephus, the, the Jewish historian, uh, doesn't write much about Jesus, but it's important that he does have one paragraph about him because it's an extra biblical account of Jesus of Nazareth and his ministry. And in that one little paragraph of the volumes that he wrote, uh, when he mentions Jesus, the thing that he mentions is the tremendous miracles and healings that were taking place all over Galilee, all, all over Israel. And, and every, it was w widely known. Paul, when he's uh, uh, testifying later before Agrippa and some of the others, he, he talks about Jesus and how this wasn't done in a corner. I know that you know all about this and all the miracles that, uh, that took place. Uh, he comes off the, the mountainside. There's a large crowd with him that some have estimated to be 10 or 15,000, although it could have maybe just been several hundred. But again, the crowd is following him now. Uh, and they would have dispersed as they come across this particular person that Jesus is going to minister to, the leper. Because, <laughs> uh, of course, he would have been having to shout, unclean, unclean, uh, and everybody would have uh, diverted into a, another direction, uh, terrified at the idea of coming in contact with this person. But that's the very person that Jesus goes to. We see at leprosy three, uh, several things that it brought about in his life as a result. It brought complete uh, isolation. As I mentioned, he'd have to yell unclean when people came by. Uh, lepers, as you know, is, uh, and, then we're, and we are talking about Hansen's disease. We're talking about the same disease that infected so many people here in the Hawaiian Islands at, uh, at one point in time his, uh, historically. Uh, it uh, attacks the central nervous system. system. You feel no pain. Therefore, uh, uh, you know, basically your body begins to decay and literally rot away. You lose your extremities, your, your nose, your ear, your fingers, so forth. Uh, it was, uh, it was a, it, it uh, is a horrific um, disease, uh, not permitted to be near family and friends, not permitted to worship God, no cure, it's fatal, and it takes years. Uh, to say that they had no hope is an understatement, it was... It was the worst. There was nothing worse than being a leper, period. And uh, so when we talk about the outcast of society, there's nobody else that we could name that would uh, more aptly fit the description. So it meant isolation. It also meant uh, an illustration. Uh, in the Bible, uh, because of the nature of leprosy, it's used very often as uh, an illustration of sin. Uh, there's no cure for leprosy. There's no cure for, for sin either. Again, apart for the miraculous intervention in the touch of Jesus Christ, as we even see with this uh, individual, uh, the way that attacks uh, slowly and so forth, and then uh, getting worse and worse. It's, uh, there's many ways that it typifies the way sin acts in, in our own uh, spiritual lives. And uh, this is something that David understood very well. Uh, on Wednesday night, we went through Psalm uh, 32, which was David's instruction about what he learned on the other side of having sin with Bathsheba, killing Uriah, and so forth. It's what he learned about that. In Psalm 51, it's his confession after Nathan confronts him. And part of that confession, he says in verse 7, he says, Cleanse me with hyssop, and I will be clean. Wash me, and I will be whiter than snow. Let me hear joy and gladness. Let the bones you have crushed rejoice. Hide your face from my sins and blot out my iniquity. Create a pure heart, create in me a clean heart, O God, and renew a steadfast spirit within me. So David is talking about how the Lord's cleansed him, and he mentioned specifically, cleanse me with hyssop. Well, hyssop was used in the ceremony when somebody was cleansed for leprosy. 
They would go to the priest. We'll talk a little bit more about that in a moment. But one of the things that was involved is the priest had to make sure he was really clean and he scrubbed the previous wounds with hyssop to scrub it down. David said, my sin, what I've done is like leprosy. And yet, God, you've cleansed me. Cleanse me with hyssop the way you would cleanse a leper. Uh, David understood the illustration of, uh, of leprosy and sin. And then the third thing is that... Uh, about this leprosy was, uh, as I mentioned, was incurable by human standards. And I, I mentioned that to re- say that it still is. Uh, now they can detect it, they can arrest it, they can stop it, they can uh, prevent it f- you know, from uh, spreading and so forth, but there's no cure for Hansen's disease. There wasn't in Jesus' day, there wasn't in Moses' day when he wrote what you do when you are cured. So the anticipation that the Messiah would come one day and he would heal lepers, and when he does, they should go to Moses and do this and go through this ritual and, uh, and ceremony. So that's um, very interesting as well. Second, we notice that the outcast kneels at his feet. I mean, again, it's a position of worship. It's a position of, of uh, humility, but it's one of uh, faith as well. He says, if you're willing, you can make me clean. Uh, he doesn't say, if you have the ability, you can make me clean. He just says, if you're willing, you can make me clean. So one of the things that we see here and with the officer we're going to meet in a moment is uh, both these individuals had tremendous faith in what the Lord could do. Uh, and then also the outcast with leprosy uh, was touched, which uh, he had not experienced that in, in, in obviously many years. Nobody could touch them. I mean, he's Jewish, he's in a Jewish setting. Uh, Somebody that is unclean, you cannot physically touch. Somebody with uh, leprosy, according to Leviticus 14, you could not touch. Jesus didn't have to do that. He could just said, be clean. You know, he didn't have to touch him, obviously, but he did. And uh, I think it's just to to teach us, you know, Jesus is willing to reach out and and touch the most outcast, the, the, the person that other people fear, he'll, he'll reach out to them. When we were down at the sunrise service um, there uh, at Easter time, uh, I was able to kind of hang out uh, afterwards a little bit with Jordan. Jordan is with uh, Horizon, who's doing the church down there in Waimanalo. He was the young guy uh, for hours over there with those kids in the jump house and faithfully uh, did that. And I was thanking for for, you know, just his patience and and so forth, and uh, talking to him a little bit and everything. And he's got a very interesting uh, ministry. He'd gone through the Horizon School of Evangelism, come over to help with the church. Uh, and they've got, uh, being in Waimanala, once they got there, they started having uh, an outreach to the homeless there on the beach, as many churches uh, do. Uh, and uh, he realized at some point in time, uh, if we're really going to help them, if we're really going to reach them, we need to reach them with the gospel. The only way I can really reach them with the gospel is if I get to know them. And the only way I can really get to know them is if I go down there and live with them. And so he told Francis, and Francis, well, hey, that's really great, man. Let's pray about it. You know, it's, it, you know, it could be a little dicey, a little dangerous. I mean, you know, so let's pray about it. So they did, and pretty intently, and then Jordan felt convinced. So he, he moved there like uh, three months ago. He's been living in a tent on the beach with the homeless down there, building relationships with them, living with them, living the life that they live down there. Uh, he's got a car so he can get them to their doctor's appointments. He can minister to them. He's got a Bible study going. He's already led uh, a couple of three of them to the Lord. Uh, he's a guy that's reaching the outcast. Uh, how's he going to reach them if he doesn't touch them? Well, he's really following the example of, of Jesus here. Uh, the other thing we notice about uh, this outcast was uh, once he was cured, he was given specific instructions. Jesus says, uh, don't tell anyone. In fact, come on tour with me. I'm going to write a new book about you. I'm going to make you the prime example of my healing ministry. We're going to be famous in all Israel. No, he doesn't do that. He's, he's got problems enough with the crowd gathering around him. And so he tells them, don't tell anyone, but go show yourself to the priest and offer the gift that Moses commanded. It will be a, a testimony to, to the priest. Had to get them thinking, Uh, don't you think? The guy shows up, I had leprosy, I'm healed. This guy up in, uh, Rabbi up in uh, Galilee is the one that healed me, told me to come show myself to you. Wow, who's that? (laughs) And and then he just begins to share his uh, testimony to them. Uh, The ceremony itself is uh, is interesting. Leviticus 14, and and, uh, I won't go through all the details. There's so much symbolism that speaks about Jesus and, and about Christ. 
But certainly part of it was the fact that when this guy went to Jerusalem, he couldn't just go kind of skipping his way through the city <laughs> dressed in this leopard's rags and clothes <laughs> and uh, hot-footing it up the streets there or the cobblestone streets uh, to the temple. He actually had to, again, had to wait outside the city. The priest had to come out to him and the sacrifice was made outside the city with him there, of course, upon his inspection and so forth. It's unique because every sacrifice that was ever made had to be made in the temple at the altar. There was no exception except this exception. Uh, the person that is leprous or sinful cannot have an approach to God. God has got to come out to him. It's a picture of the incarnation of Jesus. Jesus came to us. He is our great high priest, uh, even as the, this man would have had happened to him when he reached the edge of Jerusalem. Secondly, uh, the priest would have brought two birds with him, and probably doves, and, uh, and one of them would have been sacrificed. It would have been a blood sacrifice. His blood would have poured out into an earthen uh, uh, vessel uh, that was mixed with water, and then he would take that with hyssop, uh, and he would have sprinkled it then on the other dove, and that dove would have been uh, set free. One dove dies, and the other one is resurrected. It's, it's a picture in those two birds of, uh, of Jesus Christ. Uh, and thirdly, when the ceremony was completed, then he would be cleansed and put on new clothes. He would have been welcomed. He would have been accepted uh, there into the community uh, once again. And it's the same with us. Because of the death and the resurrection of Jesus Christ uh, and our being cleansed, we can be welcomed uh, uh, once again. Paul says this in 1 Corinthians 15, 3, For I delivered unto you, first of all, that which I also received, how that Christ died for our sins according to the Scriptures, and that he was buried, and that he rose again the third day according to the Scriptures. Again, the two birds, the death and, and the resurrection. And then that acceptance uh, uh, back in uh, the body. I think of uh, what Paul says in Ephesians um, 1, 4, and 5, uh, that he chose us in him before the creation of the world to be holy and blameless uh, in his sight. Uh, and then Paul talks about the fact that, that how God adopted us then. He accepts us and adopts us uh, as his sons, even though we've been leprous in terms of our sin. He's the one that came out to meet us with his grace and so forth. Uh, and at a point in time, as we are cleansed, uh, then he accepts us and he embraces us uh, to be part of his community. And the fourth thing we see here, Jesus commanded him to, uh, again, having been cleansed, to walk in obedience to the word of God. So he sends him to fulfill all that Moses had said to do. So Jesus reached out to an outcast, somebody that nobody else would reach out to. I don't know how, who you consider the outcast in, in our society, but uh, it's probably the person you wouldn't want to sit next to. Uh, and uh, that's the very person that if Jesus walked in the room that he would go and try and, uh, and minister to, especially if it's somebody that's crying out to him and asking him. And we could all be encouraged and be thankful because <laughs> we were all that outcast at, at one point in time. And God graciously responds to a leper. He has graciously responded to us. Secondly, Jesus responds in amazement to the faith of an officer. We see that in verses 5 to 13. When Jesus had entered Capernaum, a centurion came to him asking for help. Lord, he said, my servant lies at home paralyzed and in terrible suffering. Jesus said to him, I will go and heal him. The centurion replied, Lord, I do not deserve to have you come under my roof, but just say the word and my servant will be healed. For I myself am a man under authority with soldiers under me. I tell this one, go, and he goes, and that one, come, and he comes. I say to my servant, do this, and he does it. When Jesus heard this, he was astonished and said to those following him, I tell you the truth, I have not found anyone in Israel with such great faith. I say to you that many will come from the east and the west and take their places at the feast with Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob in the kingdom of heaven. But the subjects of the kingdom will be thrown outside into the darkness where there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. Then Jesus said to the centurion, go, it will be done as you uh, believed it would. And his servant was healed at that very hour. So again, an officer comes to help us. Centurion is uh, over at least a uh, hundred men. It could be more. And every time we're introduced to one of these men uh, in the gospels or in the book of Acts, they're 
Uh, they're just guys of uh, tremendous character, uh, tremendous uh, integrity, uh, and, uh, and so forth, with, without an exception. I don't know if they were all like that, but the, boy, the ones that we find in the Bible uh, certainly are. Uh, it's also interesting when you think about this man's character. I mean, he is, he's an officer in the Roman legions. He has a place of power and prestige. He can order people around. He can do anything he wants to do. Uh, he's not under any kind of, you know, rules of engagement or anything else. He can just do as he pleases. That's why when, remember when the, the uh, military guys came to John the Baptist and says, what must we do to do the work of, of God? They said, hey, don't abuse your authority, uh, you know, uh, and, uh, and so forth. Uh, here we're introduced to this individual. And what is he concerned about? He's concerned about his servant? No, the son of his servant uh, and the, a child, a little boy uh, that's suffering. Uh, that's paralyzed and probably has some uh, other things that are physically wrong with him. It talks about his, uh, uh, his condition as, uh, as that of suffering. Uh, he's concerned about this, this little boy and he comes to Jesus and asks for him to be healed. He's just, he's just not your, probably your typical Roman guy at the time. And, and again, who is, who is Jesus that he would minister to a Roman and a Gentile on top of it, this Jewish rabbi? But he does. And that's part of Matthew's point, which had to be a little shocking to his first century Jewish listeners that, wow, <laughs> he, he responds like that to a leper, to a Roman centurion. What's next? A woman? Yeah, that's next. This all would have been very shocking uh, to uh, first century listeners. But notice what Jesus says to him uh, as he comes again uh, with great concern in, uh, about this little boy. Jesus says in verse 7, I'll go and heal him. Uh, those are, if you're a Bible underliner, that's, that's a good one. Uh, Jesus doesn't say, well, you would like me to heal? When is the last time you've been to synagogue? Have you been attending? Have you actually proselytized to this faith? Do you have letters from uh, the synagogue ruler in this area that I can examine your credentials to make sure that you're really worthy of, of my time and consider it? So he doesn't do any of that stuff. Jesus doesn't really care about that stuff. He could see the man's heart, that he was sincere, that he was caring. He was a man of integrity. He's just concerned about this little boy. It wasn't his little boy, uh, but it was somebody, obviously, that he cared about. And uh, there were no rules. There were no regulations. There was no trying to uh, live up to something or earn something. And that should be encouraging to us. Do you need the Lord to move in your life? Just ask him. Oh, you know, my devotion, so I haven't been spending a lot of time... Just ask him. The Lord makes no prerequisite. The devil does. I mean, he does. He will say to you, you think God's going to listen to you? He's very good at pointing out all of our, our shortfallings and, and everything else uh, and try to convince us that uh, it's no use, it's no good, there's no point. But you know what Jesus says? Just come. Uh, he says, I'll go and heal him. Uh, no, no second thought, not, not a bat of an eye. Uh, that's a great verse to underline. Uh, we also notice the humility, very importantly, of, uh, of this officer. Uh, Jesus says, when he says he'll come, uh, his response is, uh, I don't deserve to have you come under my roof. You just say the word and it'll be done. That's, that's, that's a lot of humility, very important. A man of tremendous faith, but a, a man of tremendous humility as well. And then somebody that uh, understood authority. He says, as a soldier, as a soldier would know, uh, I, have, I am under authority and I have others that are under my authority. I see this one go and he goes and this one come and, and he comes. Uh, I understand that you have the authority over all sickness and disease. That was the faith part. So therefore, all you've got to do is say that it'll be done. Uh, you don't have to come into my house. I don't really deserve it. You just say the word, Jesus. I know that it'll happen. Uh, tremendous faith and tremendous understanding of this idea of the uh, authority of God. That would be a, a good concept for us to get down, <laughs> wouldn't it? It's, it's not, uh, oh, we're praying for this person, he has cancer. Okay, well, this one's got a headache. We'll do headache first, you know, to kind of work our way up. As though, as though there's a scale for God to move or, or something. Uh, this person, this family member we're praying for, Oh, they're, they are radical. I, I don't know, you know. Let's pray for my good relative. That they, you know, they're good already. Maybe, you know, they can become the Christian. God doesn't measure things that way. He has tremendous authority. And uh, we need to realize that. 
And then the officer's faith noticed, uh, astonished or amazed Jesus. In fact, Jesus says, <laughs> I have not found faith like this or greater than this in all of Israel. That must have gone over really big with the, uh, uh, the Jews that were following him, at least the ones that had been dispersed because of the leper and maybe come back around at this point after, after the guy had been uh, healed. All Israel, I mean, this was the, the center of the worship of God <laughs> in the universe at the moment right there. Uh, the only place you could come to worship the one true God, and yet Jesus says in terms of faith, which is the essential element, is what he's trying to point out here, uh, is the fact that I haven't found it like this of, of anybody else in Israel to this degree. Now, he uses the same terminology in Mark 6.6 6, in terms of being amazed, but there he's amazed at the great unbelief of the Jews. He's amazed at the faith of this man, uh, Matthew records uh, another incident of the miracle of uh, somebody else that's a Gentile, the daughter of a Syrophoenician woman in Matthew 15. And there again, he's impressed with the great faith of, of this woman. Uh, and then he makes a, a very uh, radical statement that uh, would have once again been shocking to them. He says that, uh, in fact, there's uh, many outside Israel like this, like this Gentile soldier, many outside Israel that are going to come and eat at the feast with Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, uh, that are going to enter the kingdom of God. Many are going to come. So Matthew, again, very early on, is trying to show us that Jesus is the king, the Messiah of Israel, and the whole world. Uh, not, not just for uh, the Jews alone, but for the whole world. Jesus is making a point, many are going to come, but what's going to happen to those that are already there, that should be there, that believe that they should be part of the kingdom because of sheer physical descent. And that was the belief at the time. If you were born a Jew, born a Jew in Israel, hey, you're, it's a done deal. I'm going to be part of the kingdom of God. I'll be in heaven uh, and, and so forth. And Jesus says, no, it's an equal playing field. Everybody's going to have to come by faith. Paul makes reference to this in Ephesians 2.11. He says, remember that uh, at that time you were separate from Christ, speaking of the Gentiles, excluded from citizenship in Israel and foreigners to the covenants of the promise without hope, without God in the world. But now, Christ Jesus, uh, you who once were far away have been brought near through the blood of Christ. We were once far away, now we've been brought near. The writer of Hebrews says the same thing. And there's a lot of prophecies in the minor uh, prophets about those that are far away that will be brought near. And it's talking about uh, us Gentiles. And then he uses another phrase that would have been very familiar to them. The rabbis use this phrase all the time. There's going to be a group of people that will be cast into darkness or outer darkness will be weeping and gnashing in teeth, except the rabbis used it in a different way. They said that's what's going to happen to people that don't follow the Torah and the Mishnah, not only the law of God, but then all the rules and regulations that they had developed that said how you're to follow it. Uh, and they said, the people that don't follow that, they're going to get cast out in the darkness where they'll be weeping and gnashing of teeth. Jesus takes that phrase and actually applies it to them. I don't know if that really went over real big uh, at the moment. And you can see why uh, the religious leaders of the day had just a few problems with, with Jesus uh, and his teaching here. But it had to be kind of shocking. But the point is that everybody would need to come to him and it would become on the condition that this guy came so his servant child could be healed. It would be by faith. Uh, the last thing is the obvious the officer's servant was healed. We noted that it was instantly. It was at that very hour. Uh, and that's the way it is when Jesus heals. He doesn't just kind of heal or maybe he's he or he's healing, uh, you know. Uh, and, uh, and when he touches uh, the leper, he doesn't say, now, uh, you know, you're healed now, just go to Moses, but man, keep on believing, you know, keep on confessing, you know, you don't want to fall back. No, he's, if he heals, he heals. It's just a, a, a done deal. There's some uh, interesting things that go on all in the name of Christ today in regards to uh, healing ministries that we just don't find uh, in the scriptures. The third uh, uh, episode we have, again, is the idea of Jesus going now into Peter's uh, home and uh, finding his mother-in-law there. So we see that Jesus responds immediately, uh, though the needs were overwhelming. Verse 14 to 17, when Jesus came into Peter's house, he saw Peter's mother-in-law lying in bed with a fever. He touched her hand and the fever left her and she got up and began to wait on him. When evening came, many who were demon-possessed were brought to him and he drove out the spirits with a word and healed all the sick. This was to fulfill what was spoken through the prophet Isaiah. 
He took up our infirmities and carried our uh, diseases. Uh, again, so just a couple of things. Jesus is uh, never so overwhelmed that he could not respond to the needs within the home. He just, he didn't go, you know what kind of a day I've had? I just healed a leper, man. I mean, I've been on the mountain preaching all day long. Can we just chill out here for a little bit? And no, I'm not fixing anything in the house here today. You know, uh, I don't know what it's like when you hit the door at the end of the day, but sometimes it's kind of an overwhelming thing. Uh, all, all of the needs. I mean, after you've been out there in the busyness and uh, just tough enough getting home on the freeway these, uh, these uh, days sometimes, uh, and we can get to the point where we're not, we become so overwhelmed, we don't really respond to the needs within the home, but Jesus was never, he never got overwhelmed. He was uh, never like that. We know from Mark's gospel that it was uh, the disciples themselves that came and, uh, and asked him to come specifically because of, uh, of Peter's uh, mother. So uh, they're part of this as, as well. I like what Warren Wordsby sa says. He says, Blessing in, blessings in the home ought to lead to blessings in the community. The change in one woman's life led to miracles in the lives of many people. That's what we're about ready to to see. God does come in and invade our lives and our homes, and we need to be open and be his vessels and uh, be his kindness and his graciousness to uh, those that are in the home. And as we do, then we see that overflow to others outside the home, but it really begins uh, in the home. And we see that with Jesus. Then uh, Jesus responds graciously to the overwhelming needs of, of the community, as we read. And uh, they come, uh, the sick, uh, those that were demon-possessed, and we know that he cast out all the demons. He healed all those that came. Again, chapter 4, he healed all that came. Matthew 9, he healed all that came. And we could go on with lots of, uh, of references. Uh, there's this idea that Jesus did a few miracles or, or some, some miracles and so forth. And, uh, but we don't often really just look at the facts of what the scripture says to kind of get the magnitude uh, of the healing ministry of Jesus and what he did. Uh, and Matthew says here, uh, it was in fulfillment of Isaiah 53, uh, 4. Uh, that uh, again, speaking of uh, Matthew, uh, Isaiah 53 is a, a wonderful picture of the ministry, the suffering of Jesus, bearing our sins on the cross and so forth. Sometimes we call it the Holy of Holies of Old Testament prophecy because of what it's depicting. And uh, Matthew helps clarify something uh, here very important theologically. It's, it's amazing how the Bible can clarify the Bible. <laughs> but uh, he says that uh, of that passage in, Matthew, in Isaiah 53, 4, uh, that when he took upon himself our infirmities, that means death, uh, when you're, when you're, uh, an infirmity means you're sick unto death. In James uh, 5, when it says, um, uh, call for the elders when someone is sick, it means they're sick unto death. It's not call for the elders because somebody's got a headache or whatever and anoint them with oil. When you think they're dying, then call for the elders and anoint them with oil and pray that they might be raised up. It's the same word uh, here. Uh, Matthew says, his commentary is that... Uh, Jesus in his earthly ministry, healing all these people, fulfilled Isaiah 53, 4. You say, I think that's pretty obvious, Tim. Why are you mentioning that? Because there's a lot of people around today that teach otherwise. They teach that uh, Jesus died on the cross for all the healing, all the time, for anybody that's got enough faith. Uh, they, they use that passage in Isaiah to help promote, again, Sometimes what we call the you know, prosperity or health and wealth kind of a gospel. They make their theological case, but Matthew says, no. Uh, it's talking about, when it's talking about physical healing in Isaiah 53, 4, which it is, it's talking, use that term infirmity, it's talking about the healings that Jesus did uh, here on planet earth when he uh, was here in his incarnation. Now, Peter also quotes the next verse uh, in Isaiah uh, in 1 Peter 2, 24, 25. And just to, again, try to bring a little bit more clarification. Uh, Peter there says, He himself bore our sins in his body on the tree so that we might die to sins and live for righteousness. And then he says, as he quotes Isaiah uh, 53, 5, By his wounds you've been healed, or by his stripes you've been healed. Peter there says that verse is talking about our spiritual healing. Uh, and as long as we keep those two things correct, Matthew says physical healing. Uh, yeah, it's talking about physical healing and Isaiah and Jesus did that all of it all the time. 
When Peter talks about spiritual healing, when he's quoting, he's talking about spiritual healing. That is, when Jesus died for our sins, as predicted by Isaiah, all of our sins are forgiven. Does it mean that all of us will always be healed every time if we have enough faith? No, that's not what it's talking about. Uh, again, just if you just read what Matthew says and what Peter says, it, it really clears up the issue. I think, again, the Bible is a very good commentary on the Bible as opposed to uh, somebody else's opinions. But again, a little theology, but uh, uh, sometimes the, the details are important. Matthew wants to make sure that we see that Jesus has the, the credentials. He is the Messiah, the coming king. We also want to, uh, he wants us to understand that he has tremendous compassion uh, on the, the most outcast of society. He would even reach out and touch a, a leper. Uh, and certainly he wants us to understand that nobody ever loved uh, the way that Jesus loved and obviously, that's the love that he wants to uh, have in, in our own hearts. Think about uh, uh, Jordan, you know, what he's doing out, uh, reaching the homeless there. How do I reach him? Uh, I got to go live with him. I got to build a relationship with him. I can't do that commuting over there from town once a week. <laughs> it's just, it's not going to fly. Does that make sense? <laughs> it makes sense? You can see why it's, it's, he's having an impact there now. That, but that takes some faith to do that. I mean, that's kind of a, a, a stretch. Anybody else want to sign up? There's some other Beach Parks available. We'll have a sign up, quit your job, everything else. We'll buy you the tent. I'll come down once a week and see you. Ask the Lord's blessing over you. But I, that's the love of Jesus. Uh, I just want to uh, close with this illustration from uh, Ken Hughes' commentary on Luke. And he's talking about some friends of theirs who were missionaries in the, like a third world setting had come back to the United States for some R&R time. And he was mentioning the wife in particular looking forward to, and they kind of got her set up uh, and her husband in a nice little townhouse and kind of had some comforts, you know, that they uh, didn't have out where they were serving and they were looking forward to it and had a little patio area and she was kind of loved to design and fix things up. And so she's been looking forward to this uh, whole thing and she gets it all set for them. And then neighbors move in uh, next door. Uh, and she says that, uh, and they were, they were very coarse. How coarse were they? Well, blasting loud music, uh, a constant flow of obscenities at the top of their voices. This is right, right next door. How's this for course? She said they urinated in the front yard in broad daylight often. That's, that's course. I think that just painted a picture. Uh, this is not quite what she was imagining when she moved in. The capstone to all of that was uh, when one of the boys climbed over their fence into her beautiful little landscape patio furniture. She just got set up, took a can of orange spray paint and spray painted everything. Uh, the walls, the floor, the tables, the plants, and uh, just nailed everything. Uh, she says to the Lord at that point, I cannot love them, I hate them, <laughs> as uh, we would all probably say the same. Let me just quote from, uh, from his book then. Uh, knowing she had to deal with the sin of her heart, she began to converse with the Lord in her inner being. And a scripture came to mind, and beyond all these things put on love, which is the perfect bond of unity, Colossians 3.14. In her heart, she questioned, Lord, how do I put on love? Uh, the only way she could picture it was like putting on a coat. So that's what she determined to do. She chose to wrap herself in the love of God. As a result, she began to experience a, a deeper life of Christ within her. She made a list of what she would do if she really loved her exasperating neighbors, then did what she had listed. She baked cookies. She offered a babysit for free. She invited the mother over for coffee. And the most beautiful thing happened. She began to know and understand them. She began to see why they were living under the kind of tremendous pressure they were. She began to love her enemies. She did good to them. She lent to them without expecting anything back. The day came when they moved and she wept. An unnatural, unconventional love had captured her heart, a supernatural love, the love of Jesus. I thought this pretty practical to love your enemies. How do you do that? Put on the love of Christ. <laughs> I really need the love of God. Spiritually, time with the Lord, and then she just made a lit. If, if I love them, what would I do? If I love them, what would I do? And then she did it. And guess what? Her feelings changed. And she saw another side of these people. Uh, that's what Jesus has done with the outcast. If I were the lover, what would I want done? I want somebody to touch me and heal me. 
You know, if I, if I was the centurion begging for the life of a child, I'll just, and I have the ability, let's go right now. No, you don't have to just say the word. I understand authority. Peter's mother-in-law is sick. I'll just, I'll just raise her up right now. A crowd of people now gathering outside. It's okay. I'll stand there and heal every one of them. I don't care how long it takes. That's, that's the love of Christ. That's the compassion of Christ for the most uh, outcast in society. And, and we've still got them. I mean, in our minds, we might do a list of five and it would be different, but we all have in our mind who the outcast would be or who the person is that drives us the nuts in the neighborhood or in the workplace. Uh, and uh, I think that's great advice. Hey, wrap yourself in the love of Christ. How do you do that? In the word, spending time with him alone, asking for his grace and his help, and then if. That's a good thing, Lord. If I love them, what should I do? Make a list and then do it. Is it because she felt like it? No, she did not feel like it. But as she, in the end, she did. In the end. And again, very important as Christians, and we're not to be led by our emotions. Everything in the world says, if it feels good, do it. Be led by your emotions. Every movie is a feel-good movie. Every movie says, you know, do it this way. Be led with your heart and so forth. Uh, but really, right thinking is to know, think it through, and then logically do what the Lord would have you to do, regardless of your, of your feelings. Husbands and wives, <laughs> relationships with your kids, family members, whatever it might be, do the right thing, uh, and, then, and then see the emotions come along. If it's a train driving down the tracks, you want the feelings to be the caboose and not the engine. <laughs> and sometimes we, we reverse that, and, uh, and we wonder why we have a hard time having relationships the way that God wants us to have. But if we can get this picture of God's compassion for us, uh, it'll go a long way in helping us love those around us, even the outcast. Let's pray. Father, we do uh, just thank you for uh, these little glimpses into what was uh, days and months that, uh, that Matthew could see and observe and the experiences that he had. And he's chosen to uh, group some miracles together that we would uh, get a sense of your compassion uh, for everyone, the, the people that nobody else would care about, the people that others would literally run from, uh, you went directly to them uh, and ministered to whatever needs that they have, whatever they were requesting. Lord, may we have a, a, a newer sense of confidence in your authority and, and that we just need to come and ask. And uh, uh, Lord, uh, and so that you, you can move, so that you will move in our, in our lives, God. May we continue to see that you're a God that works in the miraculous, we don't always understand it, but we know that it's still, it's still there, it's still available to us. Lord, and may we uh, be people that have a heart like yours, uh, compassion for those uh, around us, the least among us, and we ask this in Jesus' name. There is no rock, there is no God like our God. No other name worthy of all our praise. A little bit more, David. The rock of salvation that cannot be moved He's proven himself to be faithful and true There is no rock, there is no God like ours Rock of ages Jesus is the rock Rock of ages Jesus is the rock God like us. Why don't we all stand together? Put our hands together. There is no, there is no God like our God. No other name worthy of all our praise. The rock of salvation that cannot be moved. He's proven himself to be faithful and true. There is no rock. There is no God like God.
In the whispered prayer And when the laughter leaves Light as air Mystery deep Son of man Dust of man To drink this cup of heaven's tears and broken lives Spirit wind come like a fire Break again every chain to suffer You are see I find in the storms of change, in the sands of time, with a restless heart, with a careless word, my Lord, my God, my.
warm my heart The light of my world You are the fire inside me That gives me the courage to hold And when all the mountains are falling And all of our treasures are nothing but ashes and smoke Jesus, go Your hope and love. 